Greetings. It's Dan Davis coming to you from Catalina Island Medical Center on March 31st, 2020. This is the last day of what's been a difficult month for us as a country and as a world. Fortunately for us out here on Catalina Island, we have not been impacted directly, and we should knock on wood. Uh, but what I want to do today is share with you some of the things that we're using to gauge whether we should expect a storm of patients or whether the social distancing is working and that maybe we'll escape relatively unscathed for now. I chose a rather unfortunate picture for my title slide depicting a church in Italy where the pews have been rearranged to make room for the dozens of coffins which are unfortunately having to be disinfected from coronavirus. The title of this talk is Keep Your Eye on the Ball. How do we know that social distancing is working? And what I mean by keep your eye on the ball is that I'd like to teach you some skills to be able to interpret what you see in the evening news to help determine whether the things that we're doing is having a positive effect or whether we should expect an influx of cases into California and specifically here on Catalina Island. And it's unfortunate that we have to do this, but you can't always trust what you see on the evening news because everyone has an agenda, except me, of course. But what I mean by that is that it's hard to interpret the facts without understanding the filter that they're being put through. For example, you can see from the left-hand article that these coronavirus briefings are as popular as primetime football. And so the tendency for many of our news stations is to sensationalize things to get you to watch. And they may blow things out of proportion and make everything into a disaster uh, in order to get their viewing up and their ratings higher. On the right, you see the political agenda from some of these news stations. On a single day, the headline news that was fed into my, my phone included a story from CNN about how Fox News failed to challenge Trump, and simultaneously a, a story from Fox News saying how CNN failed to challenge Nancy Pelosi. Even the epidemiologists use these opportunities to try and increase the importance of what they do. And it is important what they do. The epidemiologists are tracking diseases and how they spread throughout our communities. Uh, but they are constantly underfunded. And so they use these periodic epidemics to try and underscore the importance of funding these things, even in between epidemics, where oftentimes the funding wanes and where we end up ill-prepared for the next one. What I'd like to do is structure this talk around the things that have me concerned, the things that I see that are signs of hope, and then using this as an opportunity to review what we've done here on the island. And at the very end, I'll answer some questions that have been submitted by folks here on the island that I can answer, but have also been answered online. So let's start with the things that have me concerned. Here's a graph showing the various countries in the world who have been reporting data regarding coronavirus and the speed at which their cases increased. And you can see that the United States has blasted through to become the world leader in cases. Now we are a larger country, but what concerns me is that we haven't had any impact on quote, flattening the curve. Even a country like Iran, who we generally don't look at as a leader in healthcare, has really effectively flattened their curve. And yet the United States continues to skyrocket. Now let me explain what I think is going on because this is partly a story about testing for coronavirus. And let me show you what I mean. Let's pretend that we're part of a city, sort of a medium sized city with a few hospitals. And this is at our baseline where at week zero, there's nobody infected, nobody with any symptoms, nobody admitted to the hospital with coronavirus, and there have been no deaths. And on the upper right there, you see our tally, which would be what would be reported by the public health department. Now, let's say one of our citizens traveled somewhere, maybe to China, maybe to Italy, maybe just to New York City, and brought coronavirus back. Now, 
he or she didn't realize that he or she was infected. But in that first week, that person came into contact with a hundred other people who all ended up infected. And so in week one, we see a hundred people who have coronavirus. Now, none of them realize it. They don't have any symptoms at this point because for the first week or so, you may be asymptomatic. Now, of those hundred, some of them are going to go on to get flu symptoms after about a week. Our best guess is maybe it's 80% or so. All hundred of them are going to spread it to other people in the community. And so in the second week, we now have 80 people who have cold and flu symptoms. And now we have 500 people who are infected with coronavirus, most of whom don't realize it because they have no symptoms at that point. Now, of those 80, maybe a quarter of them, 20, are going to end up getting sicker and require admission to the hospital. But that's going to take another week. Meanwhile, those 500 people who are infected are going to develop symptoms 80% of the time, and they're going to go off and infect other people in the community. So in the third week, we now have 2,500 people infected, 400 people with cold and flu symptoms, and 20 people admitted to the hospital. Now, of those 20, maybe 10% are going to go on and, and die from their disease, but that's going to take another week. Now, at this point in the United States, this is where we started with the testing. We didn't have enough tests to test when people started getting cold and flu symptoms. So we were stuck waiting till people got sick enough to be admitted to the hospital. And that's when we sent off the test. Now, in addition to there being limitations in the number of tests, it also took a while to get the test results back. So we still don't see any cases reported to public health because it's going to take us a week or so to get the test results back. Meanwhile, those 400 people with cold and flu symptoms, 25% of them are going to get admitted to the hospital next week. And of those folks who are infected but don't yet know it, 80% are going to develop cold and flu symptoms, and all of them are going to go spread it to other people in the community. Now in week four, we finally see that there's an issue. The initial tests that we sent are now back, so we now have 20 people from week three who were admitted to the hospital who tested positive. Meanwhile, additional folks have been admitted to the hospital and are going to be tested, but we won't know their results for another week. Now, because we have some positive cases on the board, we'll say that our political leaders stepped up and put us into full lockdown. And we're going to assume that that was 100% effective that at this point everybody listened, everybody locked themselves up in their houses, and nobody spread the coronavirus at this point. We know that that's not exactly true, but just so you can see what happens, we're going to pretend that there's no additional infections. Now still, we have those folks who are admitted who are going to die. We have folks with cold and flu symptoms who are going to get sicker over the next week and require admission to the hospital. And we now have 10,000 people who are infected with coronavirus, 80% of whom are going to develop cold and flu symptoms. So in week five, you can see that although we haven't increased the number of people infected because the lockdown was effective, we now have a lot of people with cold and flu symptoms. We've got more people admitted to the hospital, and we've had an increase in deaths. So even though our lockdown, our quarantine has been effective, the numbers still suggest that the cases are going up. And in another week, same thing. Everything moves over, and so we have even more cases. And a week later, same thing. Now we have a stable number of infected people, a stable number of people with cold and flu symptoms, and we have a stable number of people admitted to the hospital. And then finally, in week seven, a stable number of deaths. So three to four weeks after the lockdown, we finally see that it had an effect where the number of cases going into week eight stays the same, the number of deaths stays the same, and we finally have, quote, flattened the curve.
Now let's assume that we had enough hospital capacity and this didn't overwhelm our system. That's our hope. We're going to come back to that in a second. But let's pose another question here. What if that lockdown wasn't as effective or came a little bit late, like in New York City where they already had a lot of cases by the time they imposed restrictions? If we continue our numbers, this is what would have happened. We would have had 100,000 people infected, 80,000 with cold and flu symptoms, and 20,000 people admitted to the hospital instead of 2,000. And that would have exceeded the hospital capacity. Now, you could look at a big city like New York and say, how come they didn't have enough hospital beds? They've got all these hospitals, some of which have more than 1,000 beds, and they're even bringing in a ship and lots of tents that bring in thousands of more hospital beds. But it's important to understand that hospitals are businesses and they need to operate nearly full in order to even break even. And so it's not like a thousand bed hospital has a thousand beds available. They might have 50 beds available because they're 95% full. That's what they have to do in order to stay afloat. And of those 50 beds, maybe only five of those beds are ICU beds with ventilators. And so the ability to withstand a sudden surge in patients, especially sick patients with respiratory problems who require ventilators, that will quickly, quickly overwhelm hospital capacity, even in a large city with lots of hospitals and lots of hospital beds. And you can see that in this situation, the mortality goes up because Patients aren't getting the care that they need. Those include the actual coronavirus patients, but it also includes other patients. Patients with strokes and heart attacks and traumas and other things that are going to keep happening even despite the coronavirus epidemic. So once a hospital reaches its capacity, everything goes south in a hurry. Now let's ask a different question. What if we had enough tests and those tests came back quickly and we could actually identify cases when they were just colds and flus. Sort of like what happened in Singapore, where they were able to implement measures of social distancing right off the bat. In that situation, based on our models, this is where we would have ended up, with a very small number of people infected and a very small number of admissions and deaths, nowhere near our hospital capacity. And I want to show you a graph from one of the Singapore websites that shows you how they're tracking their cases. Up at the top here, you see symptomatic cases and confirmed cases in blue. And you can see that there are just as many confirmed cases that had no symptoms as there were patients with symptoms. So not only were they testing people with cold and flu symptoms, they were testing the people that they came into contact with and were able to identify cases way back before they even developed symptoms. And when they track them, you can see the places that they were tracking. These were churches, these were gymnasiums. Here you see in the middle, even a private dinner function that they are able to track cases from. This is really what epidemiologists want to do is identify cases as soon as they become symptomatic, then go backwards and try and contact everyone with whom that person um, had any kind of an association with and test all those people as well so that you can really nip it in the bud and prevent the spread. Now, there are some other things that we assumed that weren't actually true that make this even harder. So let me show you those things because they add to my concern about what's happening. First, a lot of people ignored the quarantine, and you saw this all over the news, that spring breakers are certainly not practicing social distancing, not understanding that, A, they can get sick and end up in the hospital and even die, and B, that even if they have only mild symptoms, they may pass them on to others who have comorbidities or who aren't as, as strong, and they may end up leading to someone else's death indirectly. As we get additional tests available, we're going to see an increase in the number of cases, but they will, they will be less severe cases, and so it may not affect the total number of deaths. Now that overall is a good thing, but it makes it harder to interpret all of the data because we may see the cases going up, even though 
Um, those don't represent new infections. And so one of the signs that this is happening is that the cases will increase even if the death rate sort of plateaus and stabilizes. And if you look at the most recent data from this morning, you kind of get a sense that that might be happening to a small degree where you see on the bottom here, the deaths seem to be kind of plateauing a little bit. At least that's what we hope. Um, but we still see the number of cases increasing, possibly uh, because of the increase in testing. Now that brings me to some of the things that I see as hopeful signs, specifically for Catalina. First off, we can be seen as the Singapore of the Eastern Pacific because we haven't had cases yet, knock on wood. Uh, we can take an approach that mimics what they did in Singapore where we try and quickly identify cases and even identify people who came into contact with those cases and isolate them so that we don't have spread through the community. We'll come back to how we might be able to pull that off in a second. In addition, California and specifically Southern California seem to have an earlier lockdown. That is that it came earlier in the course of disease than other places like New York City. And if we look at this chart that includes the various states that have been affected, you see that California is down here on the low side, on the far right side, which means that cases are increasing relatively slowly compared to some of the other hot spots in the United States. In addition, we are at spring, and that means that we may see improvements in the spread of coronavirus just due to the warmer weather. If we go back to that previous graph and we circle the places that have had the, the worst time of it, you can see that most of those come from um, northern uh, climates like New York, Washington State, which was one of the first, uh, Michigan, New Jersey, etc. And that even within California, we see a difference between Northern California's rate of infections and Southern California's rate of infections. This could all just be chance, but if this coronavirus behaves like other coronaviruses, there may be a temperature effect that will help us out as temperatures warm up and decrease transmission rates. In addition, it looks like, and we should be based just on the time that we've spent uh, with uh, social distancing measures close to the turning point. And if you look at this graph here, you can see that although the United States has the highest number of cases, each day the acceleration in new cases seems to be slowing. Now we're still going up, but not at the same rate, or at least not at the same rate of acceleration. And you can see that in this graph by the fact that in many countries there's been a hump. There's been a turn from acceleration at a faster rate to a slower rate. And that if you track the United States, you can see us trying to make that curve. This is sort of like the flattening of the curve, but this is using more immediate data. And if we're close to the turning point before we hit the point of saturation, then we may not see the same problems that they had in Italy and even now that they're having in New York City. And so another way to put that is that we may have bought some time. Again, the, the weather is warming, so we weathered the, uh, the winter time, and that the quarantine measures may be taking effect before the hospitals on the mainland are overwhelmed. And understanding our strategy here in Catalina, it's, under, it's important to consider what's happening to the hospitals over in the mainland, because we would rather not be taking care of ICU-level ICU patients here on Catalina Island and the expectation is that we'll quickly transport them over to the mainland. But if the mainland hospitals are overwhelmed and their ICUs are full and they have no ventilators, we'll be stuck with patients here. And so we need to keep an eye not just on what's happening on the island here, but what's happening over town as well. Now, the fact that the tests are becoming more widely available and that the results are coming back faster will help us in the second phase of this. You hear people talk about um, this being the first quarter of our battle against coronavirus, or the third inning. And that's the right way to think of it, because at this point, 
we haven't had a lot of people exposed to it. So there is definitely not this idea of herd immunity where so many people have already had it and their immune systems recognize it, uh, that it's unlikely to spread through the community. Even though the rates of infection seem very high, they still represent a small percentage of the total population and we're all still um, very much vulnerable to it. And so the idea that as we get better tests that we can run maybe even on the island and get the results back within an hour uh, will allow us to quickly identify and isolate positive cases and then even potentially test those people who, with whom they've come into contact so that we can isolate them too and protect our vulnerable population. So what, you sh should, what should you be watching over the next uh, couple of weeks? Well, if we go back to our grid here, um, part of our problem here in the United States was that we were only testing when people got admitted to the hospital as opposed to what they were doing in Singapore in testing anybody who had cold and flu symptoms and even those who came in, they came into contact with um, way back over here. Is there any data that we have that tell us about people with colds and flus or people who have become infected but are asymptomatic? Well, we can't yet identify these folks without the testing, but there are some data that are available to all of you on the Los Angeles County Public Health website that focus on what we call ILIs, influenza-like illnesses. This is something that's tracked every year to track the spread of influenza throughout the community. But rather than relying on actual testing, they simply look at emergency departments and patients who are coming in with a chief complaint that count, sounded kind of like the flu. So that's why it's called an influenza-like illness, not specifically in influenza. And so what you see here are the data through about a week ago, they haven't yet posted it for this week, that show us the impact that coronavirus is having on influenza-like illness visits to the emergency department, where we had been seeing a decrease in influenza-like illnesses, just like the previous years, which you see in these colors here. And then we see it going back up, uh, some of which represent coronavirus cases. So one of the earliest indicators that our social distancing will be having a positive or an intended effect will be to see this curve start to come back down. And that may happen even before we see a decrease in the number of cases and certainly before we see a decrease in deaths. Another thing you can look at, and I put some of the websites up here for you if you're interested, this particular one is tracking in real time the number of cases throughout the United States. And you see that I've clicked the box that says yesterday because most of the time when you're clicking today is still an ongoing thing. And so it may give you a false sense of security when you see that the real-time data looks like a very low number of cases. So I always go back to yesterday and you can see California here. And the ballpark that I'm using is if the number of new cases is somewhere above 10% of the total number of cases, we're still in an acceleration phase. If this number drops to 10% or lower, we're starting to see a flattening of the curve. And so you can see as of yesterday, we still had about 15% new cases. So California is still accelerating. Here you see New York's data <clears throat> that they may be starting to turn the corner because their new cases are about 10% of their total. New Jersey, um, still seems to be on the acceleration where their new cases is almost 20% of the total. So they're still on the very steep part of their acceleration. And you can run down the list and see within a state whether they're accelerating or they're starting to flatten their curve. Now that's a lot of math. You may want a website like this one uh, where they lay it out for you in graphical form. And I like this one in particular uh, because they put the new case data right next to the mortality data. And that allows you to see, and on the bottom here, you see the number of new cases, which we want to kind of flatten out. And then you see the total number of cases here. So the point where we're gonna flatten the curve will, will be where this starts to go horizontal and even starts to drop um, and goes down to zero. 
and that will allow the total number of cases to start to flatten uh, where it actually goes um, not to zero, but it hits some sort of maximum number and stays there, like what we've seen in other countries. The death rate should trail along behind, so we should see a flattening of the curve with the total cases, and then a week or two later, um, a flattening of the death rate, uh, because it takes a couple of weeks for these patients to get sick and ultimately to die uh, in an ICU. But again, because we've increased our amount of testing, we may see this continue to go up as we test more and more liberally and we start to test people who probably aren't going to get sick and die and probably won't even end up in the hospital. And that's where we should keep our eye on the death rate as well, looking for the same thing, that the death rate will plateau and start to go back down and that the total number of deaths will hit a maximum and won't go any higher. Those are indicators that we're turning that we're turning and flattening the curve. Um, and this particular website graphs this out, out nicely. Hopefully, uh, when we look at the United States as compared to the rest of the world, we'll see that we turn a corner like what we saw with Iran, like what we saw with mainland Ch China, which is here, like what we've seen with Italy, which is here, that the United States will start to plateau. Uh, but again, what affects us most importantly here in Catalina Island is what's happening in Southern California or in California as a whole. And that's why I like tracking state data rather than national data. And here's another way of looking at the same thing. This is regarding the total number of deaths, where you see that even though the United States leads the way with the total number of cases, um, that our death rate has been lower than Spain and Italy. And so we're seeing the deaths actually turning the corner and starting to come back down, hopefully, over the next week or so. If you do the math, and it takes about 21 to maybe up to 30 days uh, after you implement strict quarantining uh, to see that turning, then we should be able to see this next week. And my hope is that when I give an update um, to the city council next week, that we'll be able to report that we've turned the corner and that we're starting to see the number of new cases come down um, and hopefully see the overall number of cases plateau. This is where I get the state level data. Um, it's from the New York Times and there's been a num uh, number of articles about what perhaps California did a little bit earlier than what New York did. And so hopefully California stays over here on the right side and that we don't end up over here on the left which would mean that we start to accelerate our number of cases rather than decelerate. Now, if all of that sounds like a whole lot of math and it's not something you necessarily want to learn, then there are some folks that I think are trustworthy and are giving us honest data without an agenda. And this is uh, Dr. Fauci, who has become one of the top advisors to President Trump. I think that when you hear him speak, he's trying to give you an honest answer and a more scientific answer and try and stay away from some of the politics and way away from some of the sensationalism um, that, uh, that you might get from other uh, experts. So now let's talk about what we've done on Catalina Island. So the accomplishments, our first focus was on hospital flow. And you'll see now that there's a screening tent out front as well as an infectious tent up by where ambulances drop patients off. We're going to try to keep patients with infectious symptoms out of the hospital, but if they require attention within the hospital, either in emergency department evaluation or even admission for observation, then part of the hospital is walled off and is called the infectious side. And literally there are plastic walls that have been erected and the access in and out is going to be through that side door um, near the infectious tent. That separates from the non-infectious side of the hospital, which is still part of the acute hospital. But if you have a complaint unrelated to uh, some sort of an infection, then we may bring you into the main entrance and keep you separate from the rest of uh, the hospital in what we're calling the non-infectious side. And both of those are separate from the skilled nursing facility. We really wanna protect those patients because they are particularly vulnerable and so they are walled off into a third section uh, on that main floor. And then down below, we still have the clinic, but our efforts are to either take care of most of the of things uh, over the phone, uh, 
uh, and potentially uh, with video conferencing as well, or if it's something infectious to actually do the evaluation up the hill in the infectious tent. We're still taking appointments uh, that are non-infectious into the clinic itself. Um, and so we're trying to, to screen patients as best as possible over the phone. And we're even developing the capability when we get a handful of people whom we're monitoring and trying to decide whether to bring them into the hospital uh, that will go out there and do assessments at home using some creative solutions like pulse oximetry uh, that can be mobilized or even taking videos uh, so that physicians and nurses can review the videos um, that were taken with the patient at home. We have definitely increased the amount of equipment available, and I'll talk a little bit about that when we get to the questions, uh, but we now have the capability of taking care of multiple ICU level patients at the same time, although that will be only if forced to because our intent is to transport patients out of the hospital as soon as it appears that they may need intubation and mechanical ventilation. Now I want to compliment uh, Jason, uh, the CEO of the hospital, for being so willing to allow Catalina Island Medical Center to take a public health role. There are many things that people are asking from us that really should be asked of the public health department, but because they don't have necessarily a strong presence here on the island, then Catalina Island Medical Center has stepped up in a way that no other hospitals have to assume that position. And that includes these communications to keep you updated. And we've explored how much information we can actually provide uh, without uh, infringing on, on privacy laws, since we are not a public health department. And also then coordinating the testing, the tracking, and even monitoring cases remotely, which again would normally be a public health department role but because we serve a unique niche on the island, we want to be that for Catalina Island to try to prevent uh, the spread of coronavirus here. Now, as testing is becoming more available, we are expanding our criteria. So the current criteria include any two of the following, fever, respiratory or GI symptoms, or even, and this is a little bit of a strange one, loss of taste and smell, which seems to be unique to this coronavirus, or one of the vulnerable population, either travel to a high-risk country, uh, contact with a known positive patient, or being a healthcare worker, or having these comorbidities like older age, diabetes, being immunocompromised, pregnant, or any uh, concurrent diseases like heart, lung, or kidney. So any two of those three, so fever plus a vulnerable population, or even respiratory symptoms plus being one of the vulnerable population. Or if you're not one of those vulnerable populations, then even fever and having respiratory symptoms will allow us to go ahead and test you. And then as we get point of care testing, where we can actually run the tests here in the island, and that's being uh, arranged already, um, then we will open it up um, and even do a prophylactic screening if we think someone has come in contact with a positive patient. Your responsibility, we are at the critical point. This is where it can go either way. As we see California cases increasing, um, hoping that in the next week we turn the corner and flatten the curve. But because we're seeing increases still, this could turn into the same situation as what they're seeing in New York. And so we want to protect Catalina's vulnerable population. So please work with us on this and call the hospital before you do anything, unless it is a true emergency, in which case you would call 911. But for everything else, call and we will direct you. We will try to handle things as best we can over the phone and we'll direct you as to where to go if you need to come in. Check the website. And if you want to be one of the patients who has access and can leave messages for different folks, including the physician, register with uh, Leah in IT and she can get you connected there. And again, be a patient patient. So now what I'd like to do is answer some of your questions. And these answers are also posted on the website. Yoli asks, what's the city's backup plan for Avalon Fire Department personnel if they get symptoms, and what about Baywatch? And so 
I am part of the EMS responses in California and specifically in Southern California and have been involved in a lot of the discussions. And so the plan will follow sort of a state plan that we came up with on our own, as well as the LA County plan, where the goal is to keep people who routinely work here on the island to remain working on the island. And that includes even patient, even personnel with potential exposures being allowed to continue working as long as they don't have symptoms and as long as they're wearing uh, protective equipment, in that case, to protect the patient potentially from um, an infection. And that's a standard that we've adopted throughout California because as we've learned from Northern California, if every person who comes into contact with a COVID patient is taken out of commission, that very quickly you lose your entire uh, supply of, of personnel. And because we think that Catalina may be delayed a little bit uh, from what happens on the mainland, the likelihood is that there would not be personnel over town that could come over and fill in. And so most of the focus is on keeping um, personnel within a certain agency working as best as possible, but always protecting uh, patients uh, from the risk of transmission from a healthcare worker. And that same uh, model applies in the hospital as well. How many ventilators? We currently have ven uh, four ventilators and we uh, were um, insightful enough to uh, acquire the, the equipment that's required to potentially ventilate two people off one ventilator. That is definitely not what we want to do. Um, the idea of having eight ventilated patients on the island is a nightmare and our intent is to transfer patients even before they require intubation and mechanical ventilation, uh, but that's dependent on availability of beds over, ta over town. We're hopeful that our relationship with Mercy Air, with me as the medical director, and our relationship with UC Irvine, uh, which provides uh, physicians for the emergency department, will help expedite any transfers that we need. But we have stocked up on supplies and that includes everything required to maintain a patient on a ventilator. We have enough supplies to maintain multiple patients for multiple days. So we are at this point um, satisfied that we have the capacity in the worst case scenario to take care of patients as necessary, but that is definitely not our first choice. Do we have enough staff to man uh, these ventilators and other patients? Um, we believe that we have the staff based on all of the things that I was talking about with the fire department. We also have the ability to bring fire department personnel in to help in the hospital. And we are redeploying a number of uh, folks within the hospital to do other things. So LVNs and physical therapists are doing other things and could potentially help uh, a nurse or a physician take care of uh, sick patients. We also have a backup system for the nurses, for the physicians to bring in additional help, to have clinic personnel working upstairs as necessary. Uh, so we hope that personnel will not be the rate limiting step. Do we have quarantine areas being considered for patients because our hospital is not big enough? Absolutely. In addition to dividing up the hospital, as I mentioned, we are identifying non-traditional areas and that could include a very large tent um, that would be available to house literally dozens of patients as necessary. Um, and if we end up monitoring patients in the hospital with, with the coronavirus, uh, and that they get better but aren't yet necessarily able to go home, uh, then we're looking at alternate areas, um, sort of like a recovery area for infected patients that is physically separate from the rest of the community. And we have a number of those identified. Have we reached out to Governor Newsom to let them know of our situation uh, and the potential for needing more medical supplies? It's a complicated question. The short answer is yes. We've, uh, I, we've reached out to every uh, governmental entity uh, to gain more uh, supplies like personal protective equipment. Fortunately, we got way ahead of the curve and ordered a lot of things uh, before it became clear that they were going to be necessary. And so we actually feel pretty good about the, the amount of uh, equipment that we have here. Uh, but we have put ourselves on the list. And in fact, part of the issue that will be discussed in the United States is the over-reliance on private companies to provide equipment um, in the, the event of this sort of a pandemic. Uh, 
And so um, we reached out very early on to all of the industry partners who tend to be sympathetic to Catalina for a variety of reasons. And so we were able to get medications and equipment uh, that perhaps um, we otherwise might not have been able to acquire. So I think we've done a pretty good job at reaching out to every available source to make sure that we have enough equipment here. And again, our intent is not to keep patients who are critically ill here on the island, but to try to get them off as soon as possible. Um, another question about uh, IC units on Catalina, and are we doing anything to ensure that the staff uh, can take care of these folks? So absolutely, we've begun training with the nurses on the specific equipment that we brought in and making sure that they feel comfortable uh, with critical care. Uh, any nurse or physician who works in the emergency department has to be comfortable with critical care, uh, but these are unique patients and they have very advanced critical care needs. And so uh, we're making sure that everybody understands those with the limit that our equipment really isn't sophisticated ICU level equipment. So again, our, our default will be to get them off the island as soon as possible and even before they require mechanical ventilation in an ideal world. Do we have enough manpower here if people were to start getting sick? Um, again, I think we have a good backup system in place and that we're definitely better prepared than most hospitals in California and in the United States. Are visitors being discouraged from traveling to the island via Catalina Express? Um, probably not exactly a medical question, but my understanding of public health is that you cannot specifically tell people not to come here. I can't imagine that there would be a whole lot of folks that would want to come out here with the restaurants mostly being closed and the, the uh, island activities mostly being shut down. But that being said, I could see people coming over here as sort of an escape, especially if they realize that we haven't been as impacted, knock on wood, by coronavirus to sort of escape the mainland. Um, but we're not allowed to physically keep them from coming over. Um, Catalina Express is operating sort of like um, a subway or a bus in that it's a public transportation that people are coming over that have legitimate business here and that they aren't in the habit of inquiring as to the nature of a visit and then asking people not to come. Um, but that would be a good question for the city council to see how aggressively you might discourage people from traveling here. Um, is Abe's Liquor Store an essential business? Uh, at this point, I think liquor stores are sort of in the same category as grocery stores, and so this is not unique to Catalina, and that liquor stores have been allowed to remain open. Um, and then uh, another question again about Catalina Express not discouraging travel, which I think we just answered. Uh, Sarah asks if there are hotlines, articles, and links from the hospital for people who are experiencing depression and anxiety related to this, and absolutely our social services and mental health professionals, professionals have been very aggressive. They're creating videos like this one. They're trying to reach out to anybody who needs social support, even if they're not a patient. So please call the hospital. That's something that you're interested in because there is a collective anxiety, no question about it, about the uncertainty going forward. For me, I'm trying to solve that problem with additional information and helping people feel like they have some control at least of, of how their understanding goes but our social social workers are being a very aggressive in communicating with people on a regular basis setting up telehealth visits so definitely call the hospital if that's something that you think you might benefit from um, and then they also are providing links to various articles that they feel are useful um, that uh, that might be helpful uh, during this uh, quarantine Kathleen asks about um, posting from CIMC uh, for people to call or email government officials to demand more protective equipment and what are the city officials doing. Uh, like I mentioned, at this point we have contacted the government entities um, that goes through various uh, government agencies and we are on those lists. We have actually ac accessed some of those caches already. Um, it's probably not something at this point that is going to be helpful for individual citizens to contact the governor or um, the county board of supervisors or even our city council uh, because the, the folks here at the hospital have already accessed those resources. And as I said, we feel reasonably good about where we're at right now. Um, but 
we will definitely need your help once the initial wave passes through and we need to make sure that the right things are going to be done in the wake of this, whether it's one or two months from now or one or two years from now, uh, when we need to make sure that there are things in place to prevent um, this from, from occurring the way it has in the United States. Quick reliable testing and do we have a city plan? This is again where the medical center is stepping up and acting like a public health department, maybe even stretching a little bit uh, the boundaries of what we are allowed to do, but on behalf of our citizens. So again, you should really appreciate Jason's leadership in this sense because he has never questioned even once the need for, for the medical center to do that and to fund people to do that. Um, but the hospital does have a plan for how we are going to identify and track as testing becomes more widely available. And again, you're, we're really relying on, on Singapore uh, as our model for how to do this right and prevent spread through the community. Um, do we have any plan for testing food distributors? Um, it's an interesting question uh, whether food distributors like restaurateurs you know, and even waiters and waitresses, bartenders, would be a group that should undergo regular testing. Um, a lot of folks have asked about whether we should test everyone in Avalon and then just lock down. And the problem is that, A, it's very difficult to lock down. Even the healthcare workers are traveling back and forth. But B, a test is only as good as, as long as you've got the results. And then you know, hours and days later, you may have been exposed and it would now be positive. And so it's very difficult to pull, pull off routine testing unless you are literally in a closed environment like say a submarine where there is absolutely no trans, transit in and off um, the vehicle or the, or the environment. Um, whether we could do some version of that on Catalina Island and do some sort of regular testing of certain high-risk individuals is a good question. And it's definitely been discussed and is on the table. Uh, I also think that the folks who routinely interface with the public, because eventually we will have to open back up for tourism, that is what the economy here is built on, um, should treat it the same way that we treat um, dealing with patients here in the hospital, where before you go home or when you go home to get rid of your, your uh, garb, to wash down as best you can and avoid um, um, exposing your family or those of you who you come in contact with outside your job, uh, to anything you might have picked up while on the job. Carl asks, are there any confirmed cases in Avalon? And we now have clearance to be able to, to publish um, on a regular basis how many patients have been screened, how many of those screened positive and can be tested, and then how many of those tests have been positive. To date, we have over a dozen patients who have been screened um, and that um, tests have been sent to about a handful of those. All of them have been negative thus far, and knock on wood on that one. Um, Brooks Fox asks about daily updates regarding all of those kinds of things. Uh, we're not allowed to give specific information about individuals who have been tested, um, and certainly not those who have tested positive, but at this point we have not had any positive tests. And of all the folks who have been screened and were not tested, we track them and they've all had resolution of their symptoms within 24 to 48 hours, which is not what you would typically expect with coronavirus. So we're fairly comfortable at this point uh, that we have not interfaced with patients who are positive. Um, but if that changes, then we will be presenting those, those data in a, um, in a conglomerate, giving you overall numbers without allowing you to identify individuals. Uh, you should also not assume that somebody who's wearing a mask at work, even if we told them or suggested that they do that, um, that we suspect that they're positive. There are certain high-risk environments where if a patient was not tested, um, but they had some sort of a respiratory illness, uh, that we said it would be safer, whether it was coronavirus or some other kind of virus, for you to wear the mask and avoid transmission in the community, but that those people should not be assumed to be coronavirus positive. Um, another, and the final question was about um, testing everyone on the island like other places have done. And again, um, if there are absolutely no transit in and out, that would be possible. Um, and maybe we will identify certain high-risk individuals to test on a regular basis uh, 
Um, I think we're still trying to feel our way through this and as testing becomes uh, more available and more rapid um, to get results, we could implement some version of that. But for instance, to test in the United States, you would have to test on an almost weekly basis to maintain some kind of an ongoing um, um, monitoring of your population. And with 330 million people being tested weekly, you would quickly go broke just with the testing alone. So we have to be thoughtful in how we test and identify either high-risk individuals who have symptoms, those who they have come in contact with if they test positive, and perhaps um, uh, folks who are in a high risk situation where they deal with a lot of people um, and having some kind of ongoing testing and surveillance. And this is going to be the next year or so until we have a vaccine and we can ensure that people are then immune from getting coronavirus. So this is going to be the transition from the first wave where we weather the storm into the next 12 months where we try and figure out a way to keep the community safe and quickly identify any positive cases so that we can treat them aggressively and, and accordingly and prevent spread through the community. And that's true not just on Catalina Island, but it's true throughout the United States and throughout the world. So I thank you for your attention. I thank you for your cooperation, your, for your interest in this. And I encourage you to, to regularly access the website uh, hope that these are helpful updates to you and in a week we'll be updating the City Council um, and hopefully we'll have some good news to share because my sincere anticipation, maybe a little bit of wishful thinking, is that a week from now we're starting to see uh, a turn and a flattening of the curve that tells us that we're getting towards the end of wave one and we can move into the second phase.